Good morning. How is everyone today? Cold, a little bit wet, maybe? Yeah. Uh, well, it is typical Ohio weather, isn't it? Back and forth, up and down. Um, I'm really excited for today's lecture. We're uh, doing Greek today. Um, wonderful foundations of places that most of us in the West began. Um, so I'm going to introduce Neil today and let him get started telling you all these wonderful things. Um, Mr. Neil Murray is an emeritus art professor and was a chair, a director, a dean, and an interim provost from North Park University. Uh, he also taught for about eight years at Wittenberg, which is a little closer here to home, uh, to us here in Ohio. In addition to teaching, Neil is an active sculptor and artist. He works in a wide range of medium, wood, metal, stone, acrylic, as well as some welding. He has completed over public sculpture commissions and has done numerous one-man art shows throughout his long career. He was himself as a mid-century modernist as far as art goes. And he and his lovely wife, Marilyn, hello, Marilyn, where, um, moved here to Goldfinch in October of 2017. I'd also like to say he is wearing a wonderful tie today displaying his Irish heritage. Welcome, Neil. Thank you, Jenna. Those of you who were with me last uh, semester, I, I think of these as semesters that last fall, when we started this series, remember it's supposed to be a three-year series. And I said then, it was my intention for it to be a three-year and I thought my brain would hold out for three years. But I was always. Today you're starting to hear what I meant about my voice. I'll do the uh, I hope uh, Bob has tried to amp this thing as loud as we can get, we can get it. OK, we're talking about Greek culture. I'm calling it classic Greek. But in fact, there are six different labels we give to Greek. In a college class, I help you know the difference between Hellenistic and classic. But here, we don't care about that. I'm calling it all classic. One of the things I hope you got from last week <laughs> was that the Greek love order, their society that was deeply interested in nature and really saw nature driven by laws, not mad and mystical forces. Among other things, uh, bring, bring another label <laughs> to the Greeks today. Humanists. Because the highest thing they saw in the natural order was the human male. Now, I'm not trying to be misogyn misogynistic. That's the way the Greeks were. Women stayed at home. The outer world was a man's world for the Greeks. Beauty was in the male, not the female, as you'll see when we start to look at their art. They also had very casual attitudes about sexual orientation. And I won't get in, into that today. 
Um, let's start with that first slide. Okay, you can see Greece there on, on our map, but you'll notice Asia Minor as well because later on the art moves across the Aegean into Asia. Can we have the next one, please? Just most of you probably saw this diagram sometime in your life. And you were told that there are three architectural orders, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. In fact, that's wrong. There are two architectural orders, Doric and Ionic. The reason I'm making that point is because there are only two sexes, and they were humanists. Architecture related to the human body. The Corinthian simply is a variation on the Ionic. Let me show you how that happened. Here's the Ionic. You see that capital that's called a volut. It's almost like a fern leaf or something. It's a wonderful shape. But you've got a problem with that shape when you're dealing with columns and you get to a corner. That shape has a clear front. What do you do with a shape like the, that when you get to a corner? They had to modify the volute on the corners, which made this odd triangular shape capital. So the Corinthian, because it's essentially round, goes around the corner. Now the reason I talk about these uh, orders in, in the sexual sense, that the first order, the Doric, you notice is shorter and more powerful looking than the Ionic. It's also simpler. Its capital is very simple and its column actually has a slight swell to it called an antasis. And that, that shape, that columnar shape, relates to the bulge of a human muscle. So it's supporting the weight of the roof, and it's slightly swelling, just like a muscle swell when it supports weight. You notice the ionic is much more complex and decorative and has a lighter, more graceful look to it. Now, just like the body has distinct parts, the Greeks thought of architecture as having these distinct parts. And the strange thing about Greek architecture is they were never able to move beyond this fixed order because they were humanists. The body had to be the center of everything. And they couldn't move beyond that. The Romans took this set of orders and played with it in all kinds of wild ways that it would have been dramatically offensive to the Greeks.
Can we see the next one? The cranial spoy is regarded as one of the mo most important of Roman sculptures. It's a really early classic sculpture. You notice it's badly damaged because it was found in the rubble around the Acropolis. The Persians came in, we talked about this last week, desecrated the Acropolis and all these statues were torn down. And in a way, it saved them. We should thank the Persians for that because they were found in the rubble and they were not deteriorated, deteriorated beyond the initial damage. Last week, we saw the Koroi, the male striding figures. And I mentioned anatomy on them was sort of diagrammed. They didn't really understand the reciprocal forces of the human body. This statue is the very beginning of the classic period where they start to get the idea how the body works. And you see it here in what is called a contraposto pose. This pose will happen over and over again in the uh, classic period. You notice the figure is not striding forward so much. He's standing and he's putting his weight on this leg we call leg. That forces this hip slightly higher than the, what is called the free leg, the free leg, the relaxed leg. So they start to understand, just like I talked about the way muscles work last time, they start to understand how the whole dynamic of the figure happens here. You'll notice because now the figure has an inner life to it, they don't anymore have to plaster the archaic smile on the mouth to give it life. It now has a real inner natural life. As I started this understanding, can we see the next one? They start to understand how more extreme motions happen and how anatomy works in these extreme uh, situations. This figure was part of the pediment of a Greek temple. I can tell that because of its pose. I just look at that pose and I know exactly where it fit on the temple, because their temples had a gabled roof to shed uh, rainwater. And in the front of that uh, roof is a section of the temple called the pediment. And that thing is deep. Most people think of it as relatively flat. It's about three or four feet deep. And so they put freestanding sculptures on the pediment to decorate the upper regions of their temples. And think of that shape. This guy fits in the corner of a pediment. In a few moments, I'm going to show you some women who fit in one of those corners as well. So the poses excuse me, are dictated by where they, they fit in that pediment. But you notice how natural looking this figure is, how natural 
and well articulated its anatomy is. Can we see the next one, please? Here is the Parthenon. The Parthenon, of course, is the Doric order. The Parthenon, in fact, was in pretty good shape up until the 17th century when the Turks used it as a place to store ammunition. And of course, that ammunition blew up and blew the roof off of the Parthenon and greatly damaged the structure. It's regarded as probably the best of the Doric structures. It has all kinds of subtle refinements that help us understand the subtlety of the Greek mind. I've already mentioned the columns have a slight swelling in the middle. Also, if you tried to sight along the stylobate, that's the platform the temple is on. It looks flat to you, but it's not flat. It has a slight crown in the middle to give, the, again, the building a kind of subtle muscular energy, just the way the body has. It's not being crushed by those columns, it's supporting those columns. Also, the columns look evenly spaced, but look carefully at the corner. Those columns are closer together because you can see through them at a diagonal, and that makes them uh, uh, create a different kind of space. Anyway, it's full of endless subtleties. It's all carved out of marble. There is no mortar holding it together. The columns are made of stacked drums, usually four or five of them. The, the flutes on the columns are so carefully carved but you can't see any, any seams. But they're simply stacked. And they use metal pins to hold them together. There is no concrete, no cement at all in this structure. Everything fits together like an extraordinarily complex puzzle. And gravity holds it all together. It's called a peripetal temple. By that we mean it has the columns going all the way around it. The inner room, and you just get a hint of the walls of the inner room there, held a statue of Athena. Remember now, this is in Athens. Athena is the patron goddess of Athens. And there was a statue in the center there, about 40 feet tall, of Athena. <coughs> Athena was holding a spear and had a large shield. And she was decorated, she was in marble, but then decorated with gold as well. Now the temple is not designed for people. They inside this, this temple. They worshiped outside. You could go in if you were an Athenian, but no worship was held there. In front of the Parthenon that they worshiped in that because the Greeks, again, don't make between sculptor and sculpture the way we do because the human body pieces of this whole thing. The entire of the entire 
Acropolis provides not by an architect, but and it was his name. And these buildings seen from the outside, just like the body is. Really interesting on the end. Can we see? Sometimes reality forced itself on the ordered Greek mind. And the Erechtheum, which is the building we're looking at now, is one of those buildings that is not symmetrical, like most Greek buildings. Because there are sacred sites that are different levels. There's a rock there that the mythological story was Athena fought Neptune for dominance. And Neptune threw a trident at her and created this huge break in this, this rock. So this site had to accommodate this rock shape. So it's a very irregular building. And notice it's in what style? Now it's in the Ionic style. It's a more complex decorative style. And you see why I was creating this sexual relationship here. Well, who do you have holding up the, the porch there? A bunch of Kore, who would be f uh, female temple maidens who are striding uh, forward. Any of you who have been to Chicago and, and seen the Midway buildings downtown Chicago, there's a limestone replica of this, this very porch there. Notice how powerful these figures are. They have to look like they're not struggling to hold that heavy entablature up. But notice they're clothed. The female figure will continue to be clothed well until to the 300s. Can we see the next one, please? This is the Doriforos. That name means spear bearer. He, you notice the one hand, he used to have a spear in that hand. It's a very famous piece by Polycletus, but it reveals something that is surprising to a lot of people. Everything I'm going to show you isn't Greek, it's Roman. This is a Roman copy. We do not have even one original bronze by the famous Greek sculptors. All these famous pieces are Roman copies. The reason we don't have any is bronze is a valuable material in the ancient world, and it makes great cannons. The Greeks preferred freestanding sculpture to be done in bronze. And so you get these Roman marble columns. And because they're marble, you get these tree roots against the leg of a striding. Who's going to be able to walk with a tree root there? And you get these odd webbings. Now, if that were bronze, 
That didn't have to be that way. Those elements didn't have to be there. This is a famous figure because just as the Greeks worked through the idea of the temples with all those distinct parts and always in certain proportional ratios, this is the classic male body. There is a mathematical proportions here. The, the dominating proportion is the height of the and that's typically one-seventh to one-eighth the height of the figure. That ratio is also related to the width of the shoulders and all other proportions in the body. Everything here has a mathematical base, although it looks like a living, natural human being. That's the kind of subtle order the Greeks brought to the real world. Now notice the body type we have here. In the classic period, the Greeks established a certain male body type. And it had to be a mixture of two things, a balance, the typical Greek idea of balance. The figure had to look strong, so it's got to be well-muscled. But it also has to be graceful. It has to be able to move. It can't be muscle-bound. The best body type I can offer you to understand that figure is male dancers. They have to move gracefully, but they also have to be strong enough to pick up female dancers. And that's the Greek notion. Those forces have to be in balance. You can't over figure because that would be unbalanced. Can we see the next one, please? This is a true Greek statue. We only have three or four, and we don't know who the sculptors were. <clears throat> the only reason we have three or four is Greek ships occasionally sank. And when they were carrying sculpture, they sank. And when I learned about this particular statue, they've renamed it. But when I learned about it, it was called Neptune. Because I love that designation because he was found at the bottom, bottom of the sea. Now, if he held a trident, he'd be Neptune. If he held a lightning bolt, he'd be Zeus. I don't know why they renamed it Zeus. I still like it to call it Neptune. Notice its scale. Freestanding Greek statues typically are in the six foot to seven foot range. This is what we call a heroic scale. It's not a colossal scale. Colossal is way beyond life size. Heroic is lifelike but slightly magnified. The average Greek at this time, the average Greek male was probably five foot five or five foot six. These statues typically are well over six foot. Anyway, it's a beautiful casting in bronze. And you notice how, although it looks totally natural, They diagram the pose by the way they present it. Throwing a spear is not a linear, flat plane action. This statue 
fits in a flat plane. And that pose represents, you, you probably wouldn't have that guiding arm outstretched like that. It simply tries to represent what the pose is doing. It turns it into a geometric structure. It's soft, it's body-like, but it's also got a beautiful, balanced, geometric structure. And last time I talked a little bit about bronze casting. It's a very technically complex thing to do. And a, a statue like this could not be cast in, in one piece. It had to be cast in sections and then carefully. That's because the metal can't get a, a mold seven feet tall. So the metal doesn't freeze to the bottom of the mold. When you're pouring a mold like that, it's casting, by the way, weird, but air, this heavy, incredibly hot material, can be stopped. So when you create a more bronze like this, you have to put all kind of vent to, to the ends of our arms and so on, so you can get out of the mold get cast in bronze. Just like the plant get cast, get cast in bronze. So mold doesn't look like a box. It's got all these weird things sticking out of it. It has to be carefully worked down and put together. It's an amazing complex. Next one, please. Now again, this is a piece you've probably all seen at one time or other. This, this is a discobolus or discus thrower by Myron. And of course, it would have originally been in bronze. This is a Roman copy. Try to throw a discus while you're leaning against a tree stump. In one of my earlier lives, I was a track athlete. So I know about uh, discus throwing, even though I was not a discus thrower. I'm much too, too small to be a discus thrower. I had a good friend who was a discus thrower. Gene Pash was his name, great big muscular guy. He was also our shot putter. When we went, uh, for I can remember going to the University of Chicago in one of our track meets, a friend and I were walking of our track team, Gene Pash group, and mine was a sprinter. Sprinters are typically, I'm fairly typical size for Jesse Owens, who actually was my size. He's not a big man. They were walking along a group of a, 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 a South Chicago gang comes after us. And all of a sudden, who grew up in the city, knew what was, he turned around from the group he was a part of, came running back to us. Gang saw Gene, and they went the other way. Anyway, they throw a discus around in a circle. You don't do it in this flat pose again. You work around, you build, they go as fast as possible. Good weight people are not only big and strong, they also have to be fast. Because the speed move gives momentum to fly. So anyway, they grammed. They grammed 
on an object you might be familiar with. Do any of you see an object in this pose? Anyone? The minute I tell you, you'll see it. Look at his arms. Barb? Yeah, well, that's, that's part of one of the, the webbings. Look at the, the shape of the arms. Does that remind you of anything? Think of a bow and arrow. Look at the axis of the body. You got the arms creating the bow. The head in in straight line with the linea alba, the middle ridge in the body. And of course, it's unrealistic, but it's beautiful. So they understood nature in such a way to get an expressive idea across, they couldn't manipulate it. But they always had to manipulate it around this idea of clarity, order. Things in this classic phase cannot be chaotic, can't be random, must be balanced, must be ordered. Next one, please. Forgive my per perversity, but every time I see this sculpture, I think of wet t-shirt contests. <laughs> These are the three goddesses from the Parthenon pediment. And look at their shape. You see that shape, you know where they, they fit in the pediment. The, the drapery reminds me of a kind of rolling water or something like that. Beautiful rhythmic forms. And remember, it's freestanding. It, it would fit on that deep ledge in front of the pediment. Now, I think this piece is... Uh, at the British National Museum. I'm not sure about that, but a lot of important work from the Acropolis ended up in London because a guy named Lord Elgin was a governor over Greece at one point in time. And he stripped the temples of a lot of the important and brought it all to London. And now there have been perceived about that. Needless to say, want all this stuff back. Anyway, you can see how so you understand the female form, but they're not ready to reveal it yet, fully reveal it. Can we have the next one, please? I want to finish off the classic period with this piece. It's a grave marker. As you can see, it's not terribly big. The figures are about life size. What you see here, this is a grave marker for a young woman named Hegeso. Remember last time I talked about the Greek understanding of the afterlife. It was kind of sad and shadowy. That's why they poured wine in the graves. 
So it, it's not a happy understanding of an afterlife. And here's a, a guy so sits and a servant girl is giving her something. The servant girl pre is presenting her with a little box. That box is a jewelry box. And notice Agasso's hand. She selected a piece of jewelry from that box and looking at it. In the classic period, this is the closest thing you get to real emotion. Emotion is a very subtle thing in that classic period. I don't know about you, uh, but I find this more touching than far more dramatic pieces because it's so subtle. It, it, it's in tune with that Greek sadness about the passing of beautiful things. They love humanity. They love beauty. But they know it's not forever. And here you get a beautiful sense of the exquisite, gentle feeling of, of a loss, of a passing. Can we see the next one, please? <laughs> now you notice we're in the 300s. This is the first female nude figure. In your notes, I call her nude naked. Last time I said, naked is a person conscious of no clothes. Nude is just a body with no psychological state. Most male figures in Greek sculpture are nude. Notice the, this Aphrodite stands forth. Excuse me. She leans against a ewer. That's a container that holds water. And over that ewer is draped a towel. She's coming out of the bath. So they have to give her a reason to not have clothes on. In Greek society, women were totally covered up all the time. They were almost locked in their homes. They really had almost no freedom at all. It was a totally male-dominated world. So the only way you could represent a woman is in this kind of uh, semi-nude kind of state. And again, notice the webs there, because when you carve something like this out of, out of marble, it needs physical support. Now, this particular sculpture, Praxiteles, is known for these very soft, graceful forms. So we're starting to use this whole idea of Greek rhythm and order and balance now in ways that are more sensual, intellectual anymore. They're more just sensation. Can I? This is also by the same sculptor. This is Hermes and the infant Dionysus. Notice how he's taken the hip shot pose, the contrapposto pose, and really made it extreme. And you get this beautiful S curve in the body. You, 
But the only thing to admire is the beauty of the forms. There isn't a lot of uh, emotional statement here. You don't get a feeling of Hermes really caring about Dionysus. Dionysus is pretty much just perched on top of his arm. Now this thing is so well done that it's sometimes thought that it might be by the sculptor himself. You've got good copies and bad copies. Nowadays they tend to think this is just a very, very good Roman copy. But it could be by the sculptor himself. Can we see the next one, please? Now we're starting to move in to the Hellenistic period. Again, I want to encumber you guys with too many titles here. You probably all heard of Alexander the Great. His father was a guy named Philip of Macedon. They were in the north of Greece. Now, by the, three, the, the 300s, the Peloponnesian War has already happened. Sparta and Greece beat each other up in that war. So that war, war was Athens was a center of funds for the Pan-Hellenic League, League of Greek city-states who banded so they could protect themselves from Athens collected all the, this money. Now after they had collected the money, had some skirmishes with the Persians and they were no longer such a major fraud. So guess what Athens did with that money? the Parthenon, and the entire, and needless to say, these other Greek states, like Sparta, were pissed off. That's the base of the Peloponnesian War. The Greeks never, they were always a separate governance state, they were back and forth at each other. Greece has gotten weak, comes in, and brother conquers everything. All he has a son, Alexander, and by the way, Aristotle, Alexander's teacher. We call Alexander the Great. Built up, built on Philip's achievements, conquered all of Greece, all of Egypt, all of the Middle East, and went as far as here. Well, obviously, the Greek world is, is expanding during all kinds of foreign influence in because of this mo motion of Greece and Italy. To see a more realistic life. Remember last time I said, associate Plato with Greek idealism. Asto associate Aristotle with pragmatism, realism. It's a complicated, difficult world. And in order to do certain things in life, you have to fight. Now this figure is called a dying trumpeter. He represents one of the barbarians that the Greeks were fighting against. But they represent him as a heroic figure. He's heroic in scale. He no longer can move his legs. He's, he's got, if you look carefully, he's, he's been wounded. He's gushing blood 
Notice his body type. His beautiful, heroic, but his hair is not Greek hair. He has this torque thing around his neck, which is a barbarian ornamentation. Here's his sword, and here's, here's his trumpet. He's presented as a heroic figure because, you know, the Greeks wouldn't be heroic if they didn't conquer figures that were a wimpy. These figures had to be strong. But it represents the act of dying. Think of the ghost of Grave Stella. How distant we are with that loss. Here, that loss is right in our face. It's much more direct. It's much more like the way real life happens. Can we have the next one, please? I'm, I'm sure you've all seen Nike of Samothrace before. She's in the Louvre, by the way. She originally was part of a larger sculpture group, and she was landing on the prow of, of a ship. It was a boat with a fountain. She ends up landing on the prow of the ship. And it's, it's a good example of Hellenistic sculpture. Think how generally compact Greek statues have been up till now. When I showed you the dying, dying Gaul, he starts to spread out into space. To do so, he has to have this oval base to support him. Now she's out into real space. And remember now, she's on the prow of a ship. And you just get a feeling of wind blowing that fabric back and rustling the feathers. If you look at the wings, it's not neatly ordered wing. The feathers are being ruffled by the wind. It's all about motion. It's all about energy. You see, it's much more sensual in a direct way than classic Greek sculpture would be. And I want to finish that whole point off with the last piece. Can I see the next one, please? This is a late Hellenistic group. It's called the Lakawan group. It deals with a mythical story. Lakawan was a prophet in the city of Troy. And during the, the war with the Greeks, he said, whatever you do, don't bring that wooden horse into Troy, because there are Greeks inside of it. Well, of course, they didn't listen to him. We never listen to prophets. They're never with any honor in in their own land, in their own land. Well, of course, uh, the gods were on the Greek side. And what do they do? They sent sea serpents to torture Lakawan and his sons. Now it's a strange sculpture because it works back to an ancient principle we called, when we talked about Egyptian art, hierarchical proportion. The most important figure is the biggest, and least important figures are physically smaller. So Lacanois is the most important figure, and he's being tortured by these serpents. 
Notice one biting his hip. And look at his head. Is that a classic Greek head? Is that a classic Greek emotional restraint? It's a much more obvious presentation of the darker side of life. Bad things happen. It's a beautiful sculpture, extraordinary, complex technically. But this is what happens in late periods. Sculpture, all art, gets more and more technically proficient. But often, it gets less and less profound. Because when you have a total mastery of your medium, there is a tendency to show off your technical skill. And that becomes of getting a reputation. And some kind of quiet quality to go so grave stellar. Out in the open here, there's, it's, it's beautiful, but there's nothing particularly found about it. This was a really influential sculpture. One last thing I want to mention. Look at, at Lacan. That's not the Greek body type of the male dancer anymore. Lacan is a bodybuilder. Again, that idea of physical forces taking over psychological, spiritual forces. He's all muscle. Anyway, this thing was uncovered. It was buried in Rome. Michelangelo was in with the Pope discussing the Sistine Chapel. I think this was Pope Julius, if I remember correctly. And he was apologizing for totally changing his mind. A lot of people don't see chapel. Was not paid. It is now. He started off with a group of the twelve apostles, and he got a whole program, and he realized how bored he was. And he says, "I'm now for something. I'm going to do the creation of, of the world." Anyway, while he's there, some uh, soldiers come in and say, you, you see, see something. We were the foundations for St. Peter's, and we ran into something. This is the thing they uncovered. Look at that body type. Remember anything about Michelangelo's skull? There it is. Except Mick brings a different attitude. His figures are literally muscles. They got these huge muscles. Logically troubled. They don't know what to do. Magnificent bodies. So he eventually, with this art, he brought something greater and more, more real. Now, unfortunately, time for questions. I knew this at Greece. It's so great that it's hard to shock about this stuff. But anyway, if you want to be for lunch and ask me questions, I'll try to help. What else was in the Parthenon besides uh, Athena? What, what else was in the Parthenon? Because you talked about like that was it. That was Just a statue of her. The Panhellenic Festival was a relief sculpture running around the outside of the cell. Yeah, I remember now. She's 40, 50 feet tall. She's colossal. And yeah, just her. It's her house. That's where she lives. Remember, these temples are the house of the god or the goddess. Yes? The floor was crowned in the middle? Yeah, very slightly. 
was the roof also a crown? Yes, the, the, the whole metope, everything had to be slightly accommodated. Even the capitals had to be slightly affected because of the incline of that surface. Now, I heard a statistic about that building. I hesitate to mention it, but it appeared in authentic text. So I'll mention it to you, let you decide whether it's right or not. It said that in, in that entire building, there's no more measurement error than one quarter of an inch. A room like this probably has a foot and a half, two feet of measurement errors in it. Remember, there is no mortar that holds that thing together. Everything has to be cut perfectly. It's hard to believe that statistic, but as I say, it came from a good source. Yes? Where else, where did you meet Jesse Owens? <laughs> at, Re at, at Redford High School. My, my high school did not have an indoor track. Redford High School was down the road about three or four miles. He, at that point, he was a track coach at, I think, Cooley High School. Cooley did not have a track either. So he brought his, his team to Redford. We brought our team to Redford. And my coach, who's named McDonald, we were all there, and he said, you know, you guys, you see that guy over on the other side over there? That's Jesse Owens. At that point, Jesse Owens would, would have been, I don't know, 50, 55 years old. He was bald. He had, his body had shrunk somewhat. He was not an imposing figure at all. At all. Anyway, Redford High School, that's where I'm at. Right? In Detroit. In Detroit. Okay. Yes, yeah. Anything else? I'm keeping you, you all from lunch. Anyone have a question? No? You, were, you were mentioning that some of these marble statues were, um, marble statues were bronze and they were copies. No. no, no, they were marble copies of bronze. You can yes. copy bronze, as I mentioned last time. So this was original? Uh, this there's... is an original, yes. As far as I know, this is an original. This is all marble. Then yeah. there's no, there's no bronze. This is the right material. There's no, no, there's no bronze. No, no. no. OK. OK. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you. Sorry for my voice. I'll try to do better next time. Thank you.